Well, hey, this is a camp message. Uh, I've been preaching at camp this week with teenagers, and I decided it would be really good if we took just a break from our Mark study, uh, because I really felt like I needed to bring this message, the one that I normally do on Wednesday morning at camp. I thought it would be good to bring it today with you guys. Is that cool? Is that okay with you? I hope so, because that's what you're going to get. Um, <laughs> So this is a camp message, but I believe it's for us. So when we've been studying Mark, we left off there kind of at the midpoint of Jesus's ministry. But today, uh, we're going to jump out of Mark and jump over to John, and we're going to flash forward to the end of Jesus's ministry, this critical moment for Jesus and his disciples. They've been in Jerusalem for a week at this point. The triumphal entry was a week earlier, and as far as we know, things have kind of gone quiet. Everybody cheering on Jesus as he entered town, but by the end of the week, nothing really happening. Gospel writers tell us practically nothing of this week at all. And the scene is in that upper room where Jesus is spending some quality time with his guys. They've just had dinner together, and Judas has just left the room. And so now it's Jesus and just his faithful ones, and Jesus knows what's coming next. You know what's coming next. They go from the upper room out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and this isn't just prayer time at the Garden of Gethsemane. Dude, it's praying before it all goes down. Because it's later on that very evening when the Roman soldiers come and take Jesus to be thrown into that hole, that prison cell. I've stood in that prison cell. It's a dark, nasty, lonely, deep place. He spent the night alone there, and then the next day they did the fake trials, and then the beating, the whipping him, the crown of thorns on his head, and then he had to carry that cross up the hill where they nailed the nails into his wrists and into his feet, and he would die on that cross. He knew what was coming next. So he's praying as he's praying, he's sweating blood. He's praying that intense. But before they get out there, Jesus wants to unpack some stuff for the disciples. So he gives them this long discourse, this long explanation where he just unpacks a lot of stuff. And Jesus is kind of all over the place. I read some commentaries and there's three chapters. It's this dialogue that he has is long. It's John 14, 15, and 16. And they try to kind of outline it, but there's no real outline because Jesus is kind of, he's just, he's just trying to unpack stuff for these guys because he knows what's coming next. And he wants to give them a sense of purpose. He wants to comfort them. He wants to strengthen them. Because while they don't know what's coming next, Jesus does, and he just wants them to know there is a plan for you. That there is something coming next. And so be ready. And so he's unpacking a whole lot of stuff for these guys. It's kind of a big verbal dump on them. And he is letting them know that there's a plan, and, and it's in this context that Jesus kind of drops a bomb on his disciples. It's a huge one. It's a verse that we say all the time out loud and take it for granted, but for these guys, it was a bomb that Jesus drops in that upper room. Here's what he says in John 14, 12. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me who is that is that you do you believe in Jesus so he's talking to his disciples they believe in him he says anyone who believes in me will do look at this will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the father he goes on and he says you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, 
and I will do it. Dude, this was a bomb going off for the disciples. In my mind, they start looking at each other, going, you, we can do your level of things. We can do those because we've been with you for three years. We've seen what you do. We've seen you restore sight to blind people. We've watched people with leprosy, the terminal, uncurable leprosy, they've been healed and cleansed and whole again. We've seen you cast out demons. Dude, you fed 5,000 people and then you fed 4,000 people with practically nothing. You did these amazing, you walked on water. You spoke to a storm and it shut up. You raised Lazarus from the dead. You're telling us that we can do those things and even greater? Nuh uh. uh they're going, nuh uh, no way, nuh uh. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got things to do. You've got things coming up that you're going to be doing. You are. Jesus is saying to him, basically, I came to lay the foundation. I came to get this ball rolling, but you are going to carry it on. You are going to go on from here and change the world. It's your lives that are going to be making all the difference. It's your testimonies. It's your life stories. It's the miracles that you do that are going to show the entire world how incredible I really am. This is what Jesus is trying to communicate to them. I'm sure in his mind he's going, Peter, you don't even know. Peter, you don't, you don't even know. I mean, you, you are going to touch people and they're going to be healed, Peter. Peter, in just a few weeks, you've never preached a sermon before, but you're going to preach a sermon and thousands of people are going to get saved. You guys are all going to be walking around and doing miracles in my name. And you're going to tell people about me everywhere. You don't even know what's coming next. Entire cities will come to know Christ. <laughs> There's no such thing as a church. <laughs> but churches are going to be planted all over the known world because of you. Nations will be rocked. There's going to be a revolution, a spiritual awakening like this world has never seen before. Right now, nobody on the planet has heard the term Christian, but that's all about to change, all because of what you do next. Lame people are going to walk. Blind people are going to see. Lost people are going to get saved. What you guys are going to do next will echo throughout the centuries and thousands of years from now. They'll still be talking about what you're going to do next. They'll still be reading about what you're going to do next. They'll still be telling the stories about what you're going to do next. You have a high calling and the first blank on your page is this is what Jesus is communicating is that your calling is too high for you your calling is too high for you and oh yeah by the way disciples this isn't going to be easy it's going to be hard because this world is perfectly happy to be living to please themselves and they're not going to come to me easy they're going to come kicking and screaming in some cases. Dude, Jesus is looking around the circle going, almost all of you are going to be killed for me. You're going to be so on it doing this great calling that they're going to kill you for me. But you will persevere. You will overcome. You will stand strong. And the world will never be the same because of what you do next. I'm calling you to some earth shaking hard stuff. And it's too hard and it's too high for you. Listen, is this the case today? Is Jesus calling us to something too hard, too high for us today? I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is crumbling around us. Have you noticed? 
Dude, I grew up here in an America that I believed would be stable forever and ever and ever. I actually am old enough to remember when it was morning in America. Remember that? Come on, come on. Do you, does anybody remember whose campaign was morning in America? Really? I am the oldest one in the room. He was elected in a landslide presidential election in 1980. Ronald Reagan's campaign theme was its morning in America. Remember that? Does anybody remember that? No. <laughs> that was the year I was born. <laughs> Come on, Jim, help me out, Jim. No, he's got <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, so our, I don't know if you've noticed, but our culture is crumbling around us. It's falling apart. And listen, the world is happy to please itself and not willing to please God. And the world hates you. You hear me? The world hates you you they want you and me to roll over they want you and me to sit down and shut up they don't want to hear it from us they want us quiet silenced so just this past week there was a woman she was a broadcaster um i don't remember what station she worked for she worked for a station somewhere and she just i guess heard enough about pride month and so she posted something on her social media about having straight pride. That's all. She posted on social media about having straight pride, and her employer canceled her. They shut her up. They fired her immediately, terminated her employment because she mentioned straight pride. Dude, I don't know if you've noticed, but our nation is going in the wrong direction. Hello? Hello? It's going in the wrong direction. It's bad. It's bad. It's been going in the wrong direction for a long time, but it has hit the gas since COVID, and it's heading downhill fast with a lot of momentum. Am I right? And I know, I know we're all looking forward to what we hope is going to be a, a radical, crazy election this fall, but I promise you the answer to our cultural collapse is not a Republican, and it's not a Democrat. The only solution to our problem is the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. The only solution to our problem is a spiritual awakening like this nation has never seen. That's the answer to our problem. So what that means is it's not on the politicians. It's not up to the politicians. It's on us. It's on us. I know we like to gather together and sit on our hands and nod our heads and pretend like we've never heard of Ronald Reagan before. <laughs> but listen, it's, if this world, if our culture is going to change, it's on us. We've been given a high calling to stand and proclaim the name of Jesus, the only solution to our world's disaster, and most of us are sitting and not even saying amen out loud. But I believe that even though you are not up to the task, I believe that even though it is not in you, that there is a solution for you. I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, for us to take a stand for who we believe in is hard because we don't want to feel uncomfortable. We don't want to rock any boat. We don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. We don't want to stand against the tide. We don't even like it when someone makes fun of our hair. Right? We don't even like it when someone gets... I got a friend, uh, Art Brown, was over helping uh, Annie Oakley. His life group went to Annie's house to do some uh, work in the yard for her. And he was uh, cutting trees down all day with his chainsaw. And he got down toward, the, I guess, the end of their time there. And he was using the chainsaw to cut some branches. And something happened, and the chainsaw got him in the leg. And... It's just flesh wound. It's, it just needed stitches. He's going to be fine. Um, and I saw him. I went to the hospital, and I sat there with him, and uh, he was talking. I'm like, are you in 
pain? Or is it hurt? He goes, no. Only thing about this whole deal is I meet with a group of guys on Monday morning, and they will not let me live this down. <laughs> they're not going to stop. I'm like, well, they'll make fun of you the first day or two, and then it'll be over. He's like, oh, no. They're not going to let it go. This is going to go on for months. I guarantee you. And he's just, I mean, he's, nobody likes to be the butt of the joke. Nobody likes for people to make fun of us. Um, we don't want to rock the boat, but dude, it's time for some Christians to stand up fearless and stand for the truth. It's time for some Christians to stop being chickens and to start being the bold, overcoming testimony sharers and victorious truth livers that our world needs to see. Am I right? But you don't have it in you. It's not in you by nature. Your calling is too high. You need strength you don't have. You need power that you're not currently plugged into. This is what Jesus is talking about when he's talking to his disciples. You need something you don't have. This world is going crazy, and what you do next will make all the difference. But what you do next, you can't do on your own. So I got you. That's why Jesus is talking to him. He's saying, I got you. I got a plan for you. I, I've got you covered in this. And there is a key to you being the person that I put you here to be. Here's what he says in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. An advocate. He'll give you an advocate, somebody who acts on your behalf, somebody who rolls up into your life and unleashes the power. This advocate will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. That's for sure, but you know him. Because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Later after I have left, he will be in you. He goes on and a few sentences later he says, I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and he will testify all about me. Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you someone that got your back. I'm going to send you someone that gives you the power that you need. So Jesus talks a lot in this discussion that he has with these guys in this room. He talks a lot about abiding in him, walking in him. And this can only happen, this abiding in him, this drawing strength from him only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way these guys can do what Jesus is calling him to do is by the power of the Holy Spirit. The only other alternative is failure. Jesus is clear in this whole dialogue. I wish I had time to read it all to you. He's clear that the only way his disciples, that's you and me, are capable of accomplishing what he has in store for us is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm preaching at camp this week, and it's this message, it's this Wednesday message, I'm supposed to cover everything you need to know about the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, right. So uh, listen, I do a crash course on the Holy Spirit. I'm not doing it right now, but I do a crash course on the Holy Spirit, and we spend four weeks. Uh, it's fairly intense. We dig deep in the Word, and we look at who the Holy Spirit is, what He does in our lives, uh, how we have access to Him, and all that stuff. And after four weeks, we feel like we've barely scratched the surface. Um, there's so, so, so much for you to know about the Holy Spirit. And I, I just don't have the time this morning. So I'm just going to give you, this is what I do at camp. I'm just going to give you the top three things uh, to know about the Holy Spirit. And I hope you're taking notes because if you're going to have access to this power, the power that gives you the ability to be the person God's designed you to be, it's through the Holy Spirit. So I hope that you'll take notes and at least get these three things. Uh, thing number one is this. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit's a person. I know we kind of feel like the Holy Spirit is a wind or he's like the force, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for. You know, we feel like he's just some kind of force field or something that does something and, and that's not the truth. The Holy Spirit is an actual person. 
Jesus says in John 16, when the spirit of truth comes, he, this is really important, he uses the pronoun he. Jesus is sensitive to pronouns right here. And he calls the Holy Spirit a he. The Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. Uh, he will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. You see this progression here? The Father gives to Jesus, and then Jesus passes it on to the Spirit who passes it on to us. Our relationship to the Father is through Jesus and our relationship to Jesus on an ongoing basis is through the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit is a real active person in our lives. In the earlier service, I gave a whole list of things that he actively does, but I've cut that list for time. Um, I wish I had time to really go into all this. But you and I are engaged in a relationship of God, and it's the Holy Spirit that applies our salvation into our lives. The Holy Spirit is the one that sanctifies us and makes us holy, transforming us into his image. In Galatians 5, uh, Paul writes, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. So we always like to point to this verse for the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I, I know we love this. And, and I know through our 21st century American eyes, we look at this passage and we think that what he's out to give us is, you know, like George Costanza says, serenity now. Anybody from the 90s now? From the 90s. George Costanza, serenity now. You know, this calm, you know, he settles us down. He, he gives us love for people and we have inner joy and peace and patience. Yeah, okay, may, maybe so. But think about what this list would have meant to those early Christians. Those early Christians who were fighting for their lives, who were laying it on the line to share the gospel. Those early Christians who lived in a time of extreme persecution, where in many places it was illegal to preach the gospel. And they didn't know if they were going to be taken away and killed like Jesus was. These are people who might be scared for their lives because of what they were living. And this list isn't a settle down list. This list is a list of deep inner strength, of deep inner overcoming power. That's what this list is about. It's about Holy Spirit power, not about settling you down. Does that make sense? So the first thing is the Holy Spirit produces fruit in our lives because he's a person. Second thing to know about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is God. Thing number two is the Holy Spirit is God. He's God. So the psalmist is praying in Psalm 139. He says, I can never go away. I can never run away from your spirit. I can never get out of your presence. In 1 Corinthians 2, uh, it says that the Holy Spirit searches everything and shows us God's deepest secrets. So the Holy Spirit is God. Now, you understand the idea of the Trinity, right? The Trinity is made up of three distinct individuals, the Father, the, and the, yeah, so three distinct individuals that all make up one God. Do you understand that? Because I don't. Theologians have been trying to work that out for a long time, and it's talk about above us. It's above anyone's pay grade. Don't understand how three can be one. And not only that, but did you know that the Holy Spirit is not one-third of God? He's 100% of God. Just like Jesus is not one-third of God, he's 100% of God. And God the Father is not one-third, but 100%. I don't understand it. I don't do math real good, but that doesn't work out in my head. But that's what the Bible claims, is that God is equally in all three 
somehow. So God is, sorry, the Holy Spirit is God, and it's the Holy Spirit that moves and is the movement of God in this world. In, in Second Peter, Peter says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. So it was the Spirit, God's Spirit, that spoke to them. And when they spoke, they spoke from God, the Spirit. Um, in Matthew 28, Jesus says, he's challenged to us, the great commission is to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, and he names all three, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus equates them all together. Uh, this is a big deal. The Holy Spirit is God. Dude, dude, think about it. Mm. Uh, let me get to the next point, and we'll see. If the Holy Spirit is 100% of God, this next thing, thing three, ought to blow your socks off. Are you ready? Thing three is this. If you are in Christ, then the Spirit is in you. That's right. I just said 100% of God is in you. If you're a believer, 100% of God is in you. How can you sit there on your hands? 100% of God lives in you. Now, listen, I know there are some forms of Christianity, Jesus-loving Christians, who teach that there are kind of two classes of Christian, you know, that you can get saved you can come to know christ and have jesus in you but then it's at a later date that the holy spirit comes to live in you and it's two separate things that a christian can be a christian without the holy spirit in them until some later time and i just want to be real clear the bible doesn't teach that the bible is really clear that if you are in christ the spirit is in you Paul writes in Romans 8 about this. And if you read part of it out of context, uh, you might misunderstand what he's saying. In Romans 8, verse 9, he says, you, he's talking to believers, he's talking to Christians, he says, you are not controlled by your sinful nature, Christian. You are controlled by the Spirit if, Christian, you have the Spirit of God living in you. So, yeah, if you just read this little part, then you might be thinking, well, okay, maybe I can be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit in me. But look at what he says in the very next sentence. The very next sentence is what we call a parenthetical statement, and here's what he says. He says, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. So he doesn't say the Holy Spirit, he says the Spirit of Christ, but in the New Testament, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit are all interchangeable terms, and he's saying that those who do not have the Spirit living in them do not belong to him at all. You're not a Christian if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. And he says, Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Because you have been saved. Because you have been made right with God by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Spirit is the one that gives you life. Uh, a couple of sentences later, in verses 12 through 14, Paul says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die but through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. You will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You see that? All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Listen to me, Christian. Your calling is too high. The thing that God's designed you to do, you are incapable of doing it on your own. It's beyond you. You don't have it in you. You and I need the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen? Listen to me, dads. Just the act of raising those kids is, is, a, is an action 
that requires the Holy Spirit. Dude, because any, any lost person can raise a child, but only a Spirit-filled believer can raise a child for Jesus. Only a Holy Spirit-filled believer can model Christ to a child and show them what it's like to become like Christ. Listen to me, transplant. You came from Florida. You came from Atlanta, wherever you came from. Do you think you're here in LJ by accident? Do you think you just found a cabin up in the woods and God is in heaven going, huh, interesting choice? Didn't see that one coming. Do you think you're here by accident? God put you here for a reason. He didn't put you here so you could hole up in the woods and be quiet to yourself. He put you here because there's only one solution to our world's problems. It's a spiritual awakening. So he brought a spiritual person here to be part of that. That's why you're here. You think you got that job by accident? You think you work with those people, even the ones you don't like by accident, especially the ones you don't like? God put you right up against them because God's got a mission for you. If a spiritual awakening is our only solution, it's going to start in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in our workplaces. It's not going to be because, you know, God puts a Christian president in office this fall because that doesn't appear to really be an option. It's going to be because God puts Christians next to lost neighbors, next to lost co-workers, next to people who are far from God. And he put us right next to them to make that difference and to create that spiritual awakening. Do you think that you're in this church by accident? Oh, well, we come here because we like the music. No, God put you here. And this church needs you. I could go into the list, but I'm not going to because I know I'm running long on time. This lost world around us needs you. This crumbling culture around us needs you. And what you and I do next will make all the difference. It's on us, this generation. It's been sliding downhill for a long time, and there's not a lot farther to go. Destruction is coming, and it's left to us. Where does it begin? Yeah, we're, we're in backwoods little LJ, but dude, it begins with hungry kids at Tower Road. It begins with us serving them open-handed, saying, we're here for you. We're here to show you love in the name of Jesus. It begins with youth camp. Youth camp starts tomorrow. And poor Stephen, he's been like pulling his hair out, trying to get enough adults who are too busy to do the thing God's called us to do uh, so they can't go to youth camp. Praise the Lord. Thank you to all of you that are going to youth camp and serving kids and pouring Jesus into them this week. Dude, if we're going to have a spiritual awakening, it's going to be in that up and coming generation, is it not? I want to see that group get lit on fire. And I want to see that spread to the rest of us. Don't you? If it's going to start, it's going to start at Vacation Bible School. That starts two weeks from now. Praise the Lord we got enough people to be able to do that too. But a lot of us are too busy to do the things that God's put us here to do. We got too much going on in our lives to actually share our faith with kids. What do you think you're doing here? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you don't need the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're okay without the Holy Spirit in your life. Because listen, honestly, if you want to be a good moral person, attending church weekly and hanging out with your Christian friends and generally being a good person, you don't need the Holy Spirit for that. Hello? If you want God to change you, but only up to a certain point, you don't need the Holy Spirit for that. If you want to hang on to your control, if you want to hang on to your schedule, if you want to hang on to your money, if you want to hang on to your grudge or your pet sin or your hatred for someone, you don't need the Holy Spirit for that. If you want to be in a life group but you won't lead one, you don't need the Holy Spirit. 
If you want to be in church every single Sunday, but you won't serve in kids' ministry or youth ministry or celebrate recovery, yeah, you're right. You don't need the Holy Spirit. If you want to give a little bit of your money, but not enough to have to sacrifice anything, you don't need the Holy Spirit. Listen, the typical American standard practice Christianity is spiritless. And look at the result. We've rolled over and played dead for several generations now. We have acted like the Holy Spirit isn't even a thing anymore. And look at the result. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could roll over, play dead, and let our culture go to hell. He died to start something. And he saved you to keep it going. What do you think we're doing here? What do you think we're doing here? Holy Spirit in our lives. Scary. That's scary. I don't know if I don't know what that means. I don't really know what that means. I'll tell you what it means. It's a story I've told before. You've heard me tell this story, but it's one of my favorites. It's about the story. It's the story about when I went to India a few years ago. I went there with a Christian band that was out to just evangelize in India. Here's the thing about India. It's it's not illegal to be a Christian, but it's illegal to tell anybody you're a Christian. It's not, it's not illegal to be a Christian, but it's illegal to win other people to Christ. You can't evangelize there in India. So uh, I went with this band, and their whole goal is to do some evangelism. Their, their thing was they were going to set up these big, giant public concerts in public parks in cities in India and draw a giant crowd and... Um, then the band takes a break about two-thirds of the way through, and an old guy comes out and says, let me, let me tell you why we came all the way from the United States and share the gospel with the people in India. That was the whole purpose. Had a whole system, a whole network set up of decision counselors and everything. So it was a big deal. So we were in Calcutta, and it was by far the biggest concert we put on. I mean, the stage was six feet high. It was huge, huge stage, big, giant LED wall, lights, you know, everything um, in this big public park. And um, thousands of people came out, thousands. Just an enormous crowd. And the band played, did all their stuff. They're awesome. And then it was my job to come out and just kind of give the band a break and to share the gospel. So I, I came out and I stood up on that stage and I stood, I stood there and I said, let me tell you, let me tell you this message that I want to bring. And I started to share the gospel, the, the, the good news that even though you and I are broken by sin and hopeless with God, God sent his son to die on the cross for you, taking your blame, taking your shame, shedding his blood to pay for your sin. He died and he rose again to give you life and a relationship with his father. That's my one and only job. I, I know that script, and I'm ready to share it. So I stood on the end of the stage, and I began to share. And as I started talking, there were five uniformed armed police officers that suddenly were standing right in front of me. And they were standing there, very imposing, very intimidating, looking up at me with their arms crossed like this. And I stopped for a second. I'll be honest, I stopped for a second. And my thoughts went to my family. And I thought, dude, they will throw me in prison here. And no one will know where I've gone. I'll just disappear. What, what am I going to do? And, and for a second, I was scared. And I gulped. And I prayed. God, this is what I'm here for, but I don't know if I can do this. And as I was standing there, in that brief moment, this sense of Holy Spirit peace just came right over me. And the Holy Spirit said, I got you. I got you. So I took a deep breath, and I went ahead, and I shared the entire gospel. And those guys just stared me down. I even led the whole crowd in the sinner's prayer. 
walked him through that, amen, and I looked up and I said, now, we've got decision counselors that want to help you in this new decision. If you made that decision today, I want you to raise your hand and someone's going to come get to you right now. And I mean hundreds, hundreds of hands went up all throughout that crowd. Hundreds of people turned their lives over to Christ that night. Oh, praise the Lord. And so I gave him some final instructions, and my goal was to get out of there as fast as I could. So I start walking, and the band is out on the stage because they know it's wrapping up. My part's wrapping up. So they start playing again, and I get to the top of the stairs going down in the back. When I get to the top of the stairs, I look down, and there's those five police officers standing at the bottom of the stairs waiting for me. So I took another deep breath, and I said, well, God, if that's what happens, that's what happens. And I walked down those stairs, and those five guys surrounded me at the bottom of the stairs. And then head one, the lead one, said, you come with me. And so we walked, me in the middle of a circle, around behind the stage to where the, we were behind the LED wall. And they just stopped. And I stood there, and the lead guy points his finger at me and he says you preach Jesus and I just said yeah yeah he says people came to Jesus and I said yep yeah, that's what happened and he looked at his guys and he says we want to come to Jesus too and I was like what <laughs> and so yeah praise the Lord Holy Spirit. So we prayed. We prayed right there. They did the sinner's prayer, and I promise you we gave them CDs and T-shirts, and we were just so happy, and that was a Holy Spirit moment. I could not manufacture that. I couldn't do that. That was all Him. That was all the Holy Spirit at work that night because 100% of God worked through me at that time. Do you believe that 100% of God is in you? Do you believe that he's in you? Do you believe that he wants to do what only he can do in you? Because I know what happened when the Holy Spirit came on those disciples. It was like the sound of a rushing wind. It was so loud that people came from all over town to see what was going on. And it was Passover, so there were a lot of foreigners in the crowd. So what happened was there were these tongues of fire that appeared on the disciples' heads. I don't even know what that means, but there were tongues of fire. And then they started speaking in the language of the foreigners that were there so everybody could understand the crowd was amazed, and Peter stood up, and he preached that sermon, and thousands of people came to know Christ all at one time. The people were broken, and they submitted themselves to each other. They began loving each other, serving each other, and that's when the healings began. That's when the signs and wonders began, and like an out-of-control wildfire, the gospel spread all around the world from there, and it's still going today. The Holy Spirit is still moving today. What if that spirit was actually in you? How would your sin level change? How would your faith level change? How would your language change? How would your lifestyle change? And what would your spouse think of you? What would your kids think of you? What would your coworkers, what would your boss think of you? What would your neighbors think of you if the Holy Spirit was in you? He changes everything, and he's out to change the world. He's out to change this culture, and he wants to do it through you. I can't change anything. I can't even change my bad habits. I can't change the things I long for. I can't change my negative thoughts or my language. I can't change my family dynamics, but he can change everything. Amen? And I'm still grateful to feel his power and his presence today. You know, I got story after story after story to tell you about the Holy Spirit involved and active in my life. Do you have those stories? Is the Holy Spirit working in you to win this world back to himself? When you know his presence and you know his power and you abide in him, it changes everything about you. And I promise, I promise, your spouse desperately needs the Holy Spirit in you. 
Your kids desperately need the Holy Spirit in you. Your school needs the Spirit in you. Your workplace needs the Spirit in you. Your neighbors need the Spirit in you. So my plea to you today, I'm begging you, last blank on your page, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and let Him do what only He can do in your life. Amen?